message from my church, Emmanuel Church, Huntington, Maryland, where the pastor is Pastor Rick Hancock. Today's message. So what is mercy? Let's pray together. And Father God, I, we ask that you would bless our time together. Lord, that you would give us insight into your word, that you would speak truth to us today. Father, the reality is if, if we listen to you today and we put into practice what you say, our lives will never be the same. And so, Father, give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, oftentimes when we think of the word mercy, it sounds sweet and compassionate and kind and, and, and very loving. But, but mercy is, is that and some. There is incredible power in mercy. So let's define it this morning. I believe that, that mercy is undeserved forgiveness and unearned kindness. It's, it's undeserved forgiveness and, and unearned kindness. And so whenever God forgives us, it is a display of his mercy. Whenever God is kind to us, it is a display of his kindness, his mercy. Whenever people forgive us or show kindness toward us, there we find the mercy of God. I, I don't believe a lot of people understand completely or wholly the mercy of God. I believe that's why some people are afraid of God, avoid God, stay distant from him because their image of God is that he is this cosmic killjoy and any time we step out of line, he's going to send thunder down and lightning and he's going to strike us down. That's not the merciful God we see in the scripture. But when we understand mercy... When we truly understand the mercy of God, I, I believe that, that our worry and our anxiety can decrease and our peace of mind because of Christ will increase. There are hundreds of examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament of the mercies of God. And it's interesting, as you read through the accounts of God's display of mercy, it's often seen when we are most ashamed angry or afraid. And so this morning, what causes our personal failures? Why do you and I mess up time and time and time again? You know what? I don't like conviction. Why do the people who come to the second service mess up time and time and time again? Not us, right? Not us. Well, there are three things that Peter did wrong I'm going to share with you this morning. And these are the most common failures in our life. So, so Peter showed us the example, and we certainly followed. Let me share them with you. Number one, we overestimate our strength. We overestimate our strength. Now, we probably don't say this aloud, but in our hearts and in our spirits, we say something like this. Oh, I would never do that. Oh, I am too godly to ever go there. Oh, I am too close to Jesus to ever slip up and fail there. Oh, that temptation, that's for somebody else, but not me. I've got my stuff together. I will never, ever, ever mess up there. Peter did the same thing. The story begins in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus just celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. He was going to be arrested. He was going to die on the cross. And then three days later, he was going to be raised to life. And he even said, hey, guys, I'll meet you in Galilee. <laughs> That's a pretty good, uh, pretty good tell there that, that this grave thing isn't going to hold me down. They didn't get it, nor do we. In verse 31, this is what Jesus said. He said, tonight, listen to this carefully. Tonight, all of you will run away because of me. And Peter boldly said, listen, Lord, even if, if everyone, even if everyone runs away because of you, Peter said, I will never run away. Very confident, very bold. And Jesus said, Peter, be before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, not, not me, Lord. He said, I will never. And then he said this. He said, even if I have to die, Lord. And the other disciples said the same thing. We're, we're not going to turn our back on you, Jesus. Even if 
it means we're going to lose our lives. Church, listen to this. Be careful. Be be very careful that, that this sin will never happen to you. Overestimating a strength can be a, a serious weakness in our lives. Matter of fact, Paul writing to the church at Corinth said, Therefore, whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. We need to be careful in our strength not to overestimate that because, because there where we believe we are strong, the enemy will find a weakness because we become cocky and prideful. Given the right circumstances, we are all capable of any sin. It would be interesting this morning if we could be as candid and as transparent as we would like to be. It would probably be a little embarrassing. But, but I would assume that most of us here have committed a sin in our life at some point, And a little bit further down the road, we said to ourselves and perhaps to others, Oh, I will never do that. And somehow or another, we did. An unguarded strength can be a double weakness. An unguarded strength can, can be the point of the greatest failure in our life. Be careful not to overestimate your strength, but be humble. The, the second mistake, or the second thing Peter did wrong that is a very common failure in our lives is we fear the disapproval of others. That's the second reason Peter stumbled. The story continues. You know the story well. Jesus is now being taken away. He is arrested. And the unjust trials began first with the high priest, Caiaphas. And the Bible says, but, but Peter was following at a distance in verse 58. He was a part of the group, but really wasn't. He, he kept himself at a distance. He, he did not want to be too closely identified with Jesus Christ. And, and so he followed at a distance. And he even made his way into the courtyard of Caiaphas, the high priest. And he wanted to see what was going to happen. He, he wanted to see the outcome of this trial. And then it began. Peter was approached by a servant girl. And, and she said, you were with Jesus, the Galilean too. Peter denied it. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And, and then another woman came. And, and she said, this man, Peter, he was with Jesus. And, and Peter said, I, I, don't, I don't know the man. And then a third time, the, the crowd began to press and approach Peter. And, and he said, you certainly are one of them. The way you talk, boy, <laughs> your accent gives it away. And he said, I do not know the man. And he said this in front of everyone. Was Peter a people pleaser? Was he more concerned about what they thought of him than he should? Was his fear of, of the crowd greater than his faith? Was he more concerned about what they thought of him or what they might do to him than what Jesus thought of him? That might be our struggle. We're, we're always going left or right, not because of what God is doing in our lives, but because of what others might be thinking about us. Proverbs 29, 25 in the New Living Translation puts it this way. Fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. Fearing people, worrying about what, what other people, people think about us the bible says is a dangerous trap but trust in the lord there we will find our safety now now, now let's pause for a moment does this give us license to act obnoxious and rude and cruel i don't care what you think about me no 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 that's that's not what the scripture is teaching when we are more concerned about what others think than what God thinks, then we are out of balance. Paul wrote 
So we make it our goal to please him. Our goal every day should should be to to please the Lord Jesus Christ. Our our goal every single day should be focused on pleasing God. And and I look at it this way. If if I can please God, the rest of you ought to feel pretty good about what I'm doing. And the same is true with you and me. But let me share a third way that Peter stumbled, and many times we do as well. We speak without thinking. Hello? Hello? Anybody guilty of that? Confession is now open. When Peter was asked a third time, aren't you one of them? We know you are. Your your accent gives you away. Listen to what the scripture says. Then he started to curse and to swear an oath. I do not know the man. He spoke from emotion rather than reason. You ever do that? You you ever put your mouth in motion before you put your mind in here? Have you you been there? (laughs) Hello? Well, somebody else said, I'm not confessing anything. You ever say something stupid because you weren't thinking? Oh, we get ourselves in so much trouble. Because we don't engage our mind before we engage our mouth. And, and Peter did the same thing. He, he began to lash out. He, he began to curse and, and swear an oath. I don't know him. James 3, 5 and 6 teaches us that the tongue is a small thing. Just a small part of, of our entire body. But he goes on to say, but what enormous damage it can do. How many of you can testify of that? Man, once that that arrow is released from the bow, none of us can run fast enough to retrieve it. We can't delete it fast enough. We can't draw that word back fast enough. And once it is launched towards destruction, destruction is often realized. How many of us fall short and fail miserably because we overestimate our strength, we fear disapproval of others, or we speak without thinking? This is what Peter did wrong. But let me let me get to the good part of the message today because Peter did some things right, and aren't you glad of that? Let me share three things very quickly that Peter did right, and these are good examples for us to follow today. As soon as he messed up, As soon as he fell short, as soon as he failed miserably, the Bible teaches us that he grieved. And we can grieve when we fall short. We grieve. I want you to notice what the scripture says. Peter denied Jesus three times. The rooster crows. And then he remembered the words of Jesus. In verse 75 of Matthew 26, he went outside and he wept. Bitterly. Isn't that powerful? I mean, it, it just hit him, Pastor Stan. Doggone it. I messed up. I said I never would. And I just did. I thought I was stronger than that. He didn't excuse it. He didn't deny it. He didn't downplay it. He embraced his failure. I love hugging people, but I don't like to hug failure. I don't like to embrace that thing. But that's exactly what Peter did. He didn't brush it off. He didn't pass the blame. Listen, we can't go under it. We can't go around it. We can't go over our failures. We have to grieve them. We have to learn to feel the pain of our mistakes. And I love this statement, to get past something. Sometimes we just need to go through it. And that's exactly what Peter did. When he realized his tragic mistake, when he realized that he fell short, when he failed the Savior that he loved desperately, he wept bitterly. For three and a half years, Peter witnessed Jesus performing miracles. For three and a half years, Peter witnessed Jesus preaching and teaching with authority. For three and a half years, he saw Jesus do the impossible. And at that moment, he failed. Ah, what have I done? Psalm 
51 teaches us the sacrifice that God wants is a broken and a contrite spirit. God will not reject a broken and a repentant heart, the Bible says. But how often do we follow this example when we fall short, when we fail miserably, we, we blame others, we brush it off, we, we rush past the pain. And I wonder, I wonder for the rest of Peter's life, every time he heard that rooster crow, I wonder, I wonder if that was a trigger taking him back to his point of failure. We have triggers too, don't we? It was amazing. This, this experience happened 35 to almost 40 years ago in my life. I, I was looking through pictures. I get to be the keeper of the Hancock family photo albums. And, and this week I went upstairs and, and pulled several of them out. And I started flipping through the photo albums. And, and it was super awesome. I mean, man, I was cute when I was little. Why do you laugh? Why do you laugh? And there was a picture of my mom's best friend. We called her Aunt Mary. And she lived literally right next door to where Lisa grew up as a little girl. And Aunt Mary was a big-time smoker. I mean, her dog died of cancer. I mean, yeah, no, I'm not kidding. Loved Aunt Mary. When she would come down to our house on Saturday morning in order for me to get Slim Jims, I had to wipe my mouth and kiss her. I didn't smoke. <laughs> I was looking at a picture of my Aunt Mary holding my nephew Bobby when he was less than two weeks old, sitting in her kitchen. And as soon as I looked at the picture, I began to smell smoke. So strange. And I wonder if every time Peter heard that rooster crow, did he go back to his point of failure? Or did he remember the grace of God? The second thing that Peter did right that we can follow his example is we rely on our, and I want to say it, connection group. We rely on, on those people in our lives that God has placed for that very purpose of protection and restoration and grace and mercy. I, I want to share three quick stories with you. On Easter Sunday morning, the, before the sun even came up, the Bible says that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb where Jesus was buried and, and found the stone rolled away. And she quickly raced back, the Bible says, and announced to the disciples who were gathered together, she said, I have seen the Lord. And Peter was amongst them. And then later that night, the Bible teaches us in John chapter 20, verses 19 and 20, when, when the disciples gathered in a small house because of their fear, Jesus literally appeared in their presence and he said to them, peace be with you. A second time in one day that the disciples had gathered together and Peter was there in that group with his friends. And then a week later, when Thomas missed Sunday night church a week later, he kept hearing that people were saying Jesus is alive, but but I love Thomas. Thomas said, if I can touch him, feel him, see him, smell him, I'm not gonna believe. And a week after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and John, the Bible says that Jesus appeared to the disciples and invited Thomas to touch and to feel. And all three times we see the disciples gathered together. When we fall short, when we fail, we often isolate ourselves from the people that matter the most. Isn't that true? Yeah. I'm always concerned when, when people begin to, to drop away from the fellowship, away from the church family, begin to slip away from worship because oftentimes it, it speaks to, to isolation and isolation because often there's something in their lives. But there's something powerfully strong about the group dynamic. There's something powerful when we come together and when people really mean it and they ask, how are you doing? And we say, I'm not doing well. So let's talk. And there's love and there's grace and there's mercy. Peter did the right thing. He didn't isolate himself. He made sure he stayed with the group. I encourage you, 
to get in a connection group. A third thing that we see is we cast ourselves on God's mercy. Peter did it right. Peter did it right. We, we cast ourselves on God's mercy. It's, it's not by accident that, that, that Peter begins to write his first letter. Guess what it's called? It's called First Peter. And he wrote a second one. Guess what that one's called? You guys are incredible. Theologians. After verses 1 and 2 where Peter does the, the niceties, hey guys, how are you? This is who I am. In verse 3, this is how he begins his letter. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you think that mercy meant something to Peter? Absolutely. Again, mercy is undeserved forgiveness and unearned kindness. Boy, who can't use some of that well we've looked at what Peter did wrong and we follow that example we've looked at what Peter did right and we can certainly follow that example and here's our last question and we'll finish with this what does Jesus do with our failures because the message title is our failures and God's mercy and so what does God do when we mess up I'm going to encourage you with five things very quickly number one you're going to love this he isn't shocked when we fail. God is not shocked or caught off guard or surprised when we fall short or when we fail miserably. Psalm 103 verse 14, the Bible says, for God knows, he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are just dust. God knows you inside and out. He's, he's there before you even think about going there. He's still back here before you ever decided to leave. He's in you and around you and through you. He's over you, before you, beside you, under you. God has completely enveloped you with his presence. He knows us. Listen to this. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that Satan wanted to come after Peter and even predicted his denials. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said to Peter, he, he called him Simon. He said, Simon, Simon. He said, look out. Look out. He said, Satan wants to sift you. In other words, he wants to eat your lunch, Simon. Peter, he's coming after you. It wasn't a surprise to Jesus. Jesus knew that, that Satan was going to go after Peter. And Jesus knew that Peter was going to fall short. And he said this before the denials ever happened. What happens in heaven when you mess up? Do, do you think Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit run down the streets of gold and find the Holy Father and come before him and say, Father, Father, you're not going to believe this. Bill messed up. Jim messed up. Karen messed up. Oh, <laughs> that never happens. They never meet an emergency session shocked by our failure. But let me be quick to say this is not an excuse to fail or to sin or to continue rebelling against God. What shall we continue in sin that grace, grace might abound? And Peter, Paul said, absolutely not. He isn't shocked when we fall short. Number two, he prays for us. He prays for you. In Luke chapter 22, I'm going to share something incredible with you. In Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, again, he said, Simon, Simon, look out. Satan wants to sift you like wheat. And then Jesus says, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Isn't that cool? Jeff, Satan's coming after you, bro. He's gonna mess you up. Jesus said, but I'm praying for you. He said, well, that was just one time. No. In Hebrews 7, 25, the Bible teaches us that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Right now, he's praying for you by name. Isn't that cool? That's what Jesus does. He ever liveth to make intercession to pray for you. Well, that's humbling, isn't it? In the midst of my sin, in the midst of my failure, 
Jesus says, I'm praying for you. Right now, I'm praying for you. That's so powerful. Number three, he believes in us. He's in our corner. He's, he's your number one champion. Listen to what Luke 22, 31, and 32 continues to say. Simon, Simon, look, look out. Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but, but I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And, and then he says, and you, Peter, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Isn't that cool? Peter, I know you're about to blow it, man. I know you're about to mess up, Peter. I'm praying for you that your faith does not fail. And when you get your act together, Peter, because I know you will, you strengthen the brothers around you. Notice Jesus didn't say if. Isn't that cool? Number four. He shows us mercy when we're down. He shows us mercy when we are down. Long story in John chapter 21 verses 1 through 14. But let me just summarize it for you very quickly. Peter and the disciples are discouraged. Jesus uh, was dead. He was raised uh, to life again. And Peter's discouraged. And he says to his friends, he said, guys, I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. I'm, I'm just going to go back to do what, what, what I know how to do. And the other disciple says, well, we'll go with you. And the Bible says in John chapter 21 that they, that they fished all night long. And then Jesus walks along the shore and he says, hey, friends, you catch any fish? No. They sat back across the water. We fished all night and haven't caught any fish. And the stranger from the shore, who doesn't even have a fishing rod in his hand, he doesn't know how to fish, says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And they did. And began to pull in the nets, and they couldn't because of so many fish. 153, we learn later. And John says, that's the Lord. And Peter puts his robe back on because he had stripped down to his britches to fish. <laughs> and he jumps into the water and he swims to the shore. And Jesus had planned this breakfast for a long time, Pastor Stan. Not 150 folk coming, but he had some. And when Peter got to the shore, the coals had already burned down and there were fish. And there was bread. And he said to them, come and have some breakfast. No, I told you so. No, I can't believe, Peter, you did this. Not once did he say to the disciples, I told you that all of you were going to run away, didn't I? Never once do we see Jesus with his folded arms. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are never end. They are new every morning. No wonder, Lamentation says, great is your faithfulness. What does God do with our failures? The last one. He uses our failures to advance his kingdom. He uses our failures to build his church. He uses our failures to do something good if we give it to him and we trust his mercy. In John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, while they were sitting there eating breakfast, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Hey, Pete, you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Hey, Pete, yes, Lord, you love me? Yeah, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs, Peter. Hey, Pete, let me ask you something. Yes, Lord. 
Do you love me? Lord, you know all things. God, you know I love you. He said, shepherd my sheep. God's mercy was just enough to match Peter's failure. What did Peter do with the mercy of the most tragic, epic failure of his life? Just 50 days later, there's a preacher who stands in front of a large crowd. We read the story in Acts chapter 2. A, a man gets up and begins to, to proclaim the, the goodness of God and the glory of Jesus Christ and, and walks through the history lesson. And 3,000 people, 3,000, 3,000 people were, were saved that day and were added to the church. You'll never guess who the preacher was. Somebody say Peter. Yeah. That's mercy at its best. What failure have you had that God wants to use to build his church. Well, what failure have you experienced in life that, that, that if you give it to God, he can do something awesome with it? Don't waste your failures. Is it your anger or divorce or addiction or, or financing or poor parenting or fill in the blank? Give it to him. And watch God do something miraculous. So the next time you, you fail, the next time you fall short, the, the next time you have a, an epic failure in your life, are, are you going to respond like Judas or are you going to respond like Peter? See, one had a breakdown. The other had a breakthrough. One tragically died at his own hand and the other lived like never before. So you might be in the midst of your greatest failure ever. But I'm telling you, my friend, there is power and strength and new life and new hope in the mercy of God. Peter found life after he failed, and so can you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. God, I pray today that I pray today, Lord, that your mercy would be greater than our mistakes. And God, that we would realize that. Father, I pray today that during this time of, of prayer and, and celebration of the Lord's Supper, Lord, that this would be a time of confession and repentance and reliance on the mercy of God. We pray this with joy and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to take your... This has been an audio broadcast from Emmanuel Church, Huntingtown, Maryland, where the pastor is, Pastor Rick Hancock. We thank you for tuning in to this audio broadcast.